All right, so we will let uh, Professor Moisoy take take it over. And if you have any questions at any time, uh, just drop them into the chat, please. Do not be shy. We definitely want a conversation started here. We will have time for Q and A um, as well, but we definitely don't want you to forget a question or comment if it comes to you. Please use the chat. All right, take it away, Professor Moisoy. Hello, uh, Happy New Year, belated Happy New Year, and I'm glad to. Uh, joined the roundtable discussion today and very excited to share some of our work. Um, so we have started uh, to uh, this project to look at uh, mitochondrial dysfunction and DNA damage and repair in chromosome 8P. And I'm working on this project together with uh, Marta Dominguez Prieto, which um, has, uh, is, she's here and she had said hello, waved to, to the team. Uh, so what we wanted to do was to phenotype mitochondrial homeostasis in 8P fibroblasts, to phenotype DNA damage susceptibility in 8P fibroblasts, and to start to uh, use a methodology of cell painting assay to label various compartments in the cells and to see if we can distinguish different phenotypes. Um, so the overall purpose for this uh, is to identify some endpoints that can be used for drug screening for repurposing. So we have started this work with a number of cell lines, which I have listed here. And um, as we do in this type of work, we use control lines and HP lines. And uh, we have been recommended, uh, or um, we have been distributed some HP lines that are um, no, uh, from children with various uh, mutations. And we have also got um, control lines from parents, but we also um, have chosen to get some control lines for um, fibroblasts with uh, normal lines, but age match with the um, uh, age of the 8P heroes. So that kind of introduced um, a layer of complexity in the way we analyze the data and we have had a number of discussions with the team on how would be best to group this um, analysis. So we ended up with two types of analysis, one in which we have the um, HP line compared with the parents and one in which we have several HP lines, four of them compared with age much control from um, children that have no chromosome uh, mutations. I'm just listing here the AP lines that we have used. So we have a variety of um, mutations that have been included in the analysis, but despite uh, of, uh, for example, a couple of them looking more uh, similar, there are, um, you will see uh, strong differences between individual lines on how they respond to our analysis. So in looking at mitochondrial homeostasis, um, we have used a range of assays and we have uh, challenged the cells with uh, treatments with um, oxidative stress using 6-hydroxydopamine at two different concentrations. And we have also uh, used two types of media one media with high glucose, which is normally used for culturing cell lines. And we have also used um, galactose media, which pushes the mitochondrial um, homeostasis, mitochondrial um, respiration towards an oxidative phosphorylation uh, phenotype in the process of ATP production. And we have looked at various uh, parameters in this analysis. Two that uh, we are going to discuss today are uh, cell viability with an MTT assay. And we have also uh, uh, looked at ATP levels. Um, we have taken data uh, for mitochondrial membrane potential and also for accumulation of oxidative species, but these are not analyzed yet. So by using two types of media, we also, uh, we introduced another layer of complexity in the analysis. So um, because of the numerous cell lines that we have, the different types of analysis and the two different types of media, we ended up with quite a lot of data that we need to look at quite carefully in order to draw conclusion for the type of um, 
uh, interpretation that we want to get. So in the high glucose media, uh, the assay of challenging the cell suite oxidative stress and analysis of survival and ATP levels did not show um, very strong differences uh, in terms of viability and ATP. However, we noticed that in the viability assay, the ATP line seems to have um, a bit more resistant to cell death. And also comparing with the father, the mother cells are also showing a bit of resistance in the uh, cell viability assay. But we couldn't see any changes in the ATP levels. In the comparison of the ATP lines with HMASH controls, we didn't see any changes in the uh, MTT survival assay. But we have seen that there is uh, quite um, strong variability between the eight P lines uh, themselves. So some of them appear to have stronger resistance to cell death. And one of them that we have picked is this line 011 DD48, which appears to be more consistently resistant, resistant to cell death assay. And that has been consistent for the two concentrations of 6 hydroxy dopamine that we have used. For ATP measurements, we didn't see any difference, significant difference between the controls and ATP lines for both concentration 50 and 75 micromolar of 6 hydroxy dopamine. So this results in high glucose media. So the conclusion from this uh, part of the work is that uh, we don't see much difference between the control and AP lines when we use 6-hydroxydopamine in high glucose media. However, there are some differences between the AP lines themselves, and one of them appears to be more resistant to um, cell death when we treat the cells with an oxidative stress um, challenge. In the galactose media, which shift, shifts the metabolism of mitochondria towards oxidative phosphorylation, we see more differences in terms of uh, how the challenge um, of oxidative stress affects the cells. For the family trio, we didn't see any difference in the MTT um, assay in the viability. However, it seems that the ATP level is significantly decreased in the ATP line comparing to the parent control, both parent controls. Also in the galactose media, when we compare the 8P lines to the HMASH control, there is a difference between the 8P lines um, compared to the controls, both in the MTT and in the ATP. However, they are slightly going in a slightly different direction. So it seems that ATP lines are more resistant to cell death, but um, they have a decrease in ATP levels. And we can see that quite well for all the all four eight lines comparing to the controls. And also when we pull the data, that difference is significant. And again, we see that there are differences between the individual lines when we analyze these parameters separately. So in the galactose media, AT lines show less decrease in survivability, but more significant decrease in ATP line, uh, levels. And there are differences between the AP lines themselves and between the ATP lines and the various controls that we have. Um, chosen to compare with. The other parameter that we are looking at is um, the DNA damage susceptibility in the fibroblast. And the assay that we are um, undertaking is we are treating the cells with lomycin, which is inducing DNA damage. And we are analyzing the repair process, which will um, are assaying with uh, an immunofluorescence-based assay. We label two 
markers of DNA repair, which are uh, gamma H2AX phosphorylated and another protein, which is uh, 53BP1. So they appear as foci in the nucleus, and we are looking at both of them separately and in correlation for colocalization to see whether they overlap and how much. We also did this assay in high glucose and galactose media, just to compare how the two uh, types of growth conditions uh, are taking an effect on the assay. So this is how it looks, our assay. So we have the nuclei of the cells labeled in blue, and after treatment with adomycin, we get these sites of DNA damage and repair, where the two proteins that are important in the repair process are being targeted. So when there is a DNA uh, break, um, the proteins that we are looking at, H2AX and uh, 53BP1, are targeted to that, that site and are involved in the process of repair. Um, for a long time, the key protein that was used in terms of detecting DNA damage and repair was H2AX, and more recently, 53BP1 um, has been added to this assay. So we have looked at both of them and tried to see what kind of information we can get. So um, we have tested the assay for various concentrations of bromycin, and we have selected a concentration where uh, there is no saturation of the assay. And then we have started to look at um, analysis of the cell lines uh, treated with 20 microgram per ml of bleomycin and untreated cells. So this is the type of data that we are getting and we are still in the process of analysis of the data. And um, so what we are measuring are, the key parameters are the number of dots that we see in the nucleus, the object count, the intensity of the fluorescence of those dots, average intensity, and also the area of that um, spot. We do that for both uh, markers, and we have also the possibility to look at the overlap um, number and area uh, that we have in each nucleus. So we get similar results, which is good. And uh, perhaps in terms of screening, just looking at one of these parameters would be um, sufficient because they look very similar. So in terms of analysis, um, because this is still work in progress, I'm showing you how um, we can distinguish between the different lines. I'm not sure if some of the graphs are not covered by. So we take the values of our counts, which are done uh, automatically by the imaging system. And then we can um, do our different types of analysis, either looking at the uh, family trio or at the 8P lines in comparison with the um, HMARSH controls. So we have done this analysis for one of the plates. I'm not sure where. Perhaps this is better. And um, we have looked first at the raw data which I'm showing you here in the first graph for H2AX. And we have seen that um, the 8P lines accumulate more DNA damage after the treatment with bleomycin. And we see that in the various types of uh, comparisons that we make. But we also want to be able to compare between different experiments. So now we have run uh, several plates. And in order to be able to compare them, we want to normalize the data in each plate, each treatment to the untreated control. So there we see that um, how the between plates the comparison is made and how much the treatment increases the accumulation of DNA damage. 
So we have um, done this as a test for two different types of um, media for the glucose and galactose. And we can see that there is a clear difference in how the DNA damage accumulates in the glucose um, and galactose between the control and AP lines. So in the glucose, there is uh, clearly more accumulation of um, damage in the um, AP lines as compared to the controls, but that is even more pronounced in the galactose media. And interestingly, in the galactose media, we see a lot more variability between the AP uh, lines and controls and between the lines themselves. So we have a few more plates to analyze to complete this um, assay and then to be able to conclude on how this each individual line behaves. We have also looked at some of the uh, transcriptional level for a number of stress signaling markers. And we had um, in mind to look at ER stress markers, mitochondrial stress markers, and um, integrated stress response markers. And for the moment, we have only done transcriptional analysis in cells untreated. Um, also, I have to mention that this uh, assay is done in high glucose media, and we didn't do yet a galactose um, analysis. So, we were expecting to see um, an increase or a higher level of stress markers in the AP lines. But the results are actually the other way around a little bit, um, both in the family trio comparison and in the AP lines versus H-match control comparison. So for the family trio, so the ER stress markers are deep, and job. The um, mitochondrial stress markers are CPN10 and HSP60. And we have two additional markers, ATF4 and ATF5, which are ATF4 is clear uh, indicator of ER stress. And ATF5, along with job, they kind of um, are involved in several stress pathways, uh, including ER stress integrated stress response and mitochondrial stress. So in the family trio, we see a decrease in some of these markers in the 8P line. Um, here we have normalized to the values for the father as the control, uh, mother control had more variability in the, between the different experimental um, data sets. In the HP lines group versus the HMARSH control, we have pulled the HMARSH control for uh, comparison, and then uh, we have um, normalized everything to that. And we see again that the HP lines have um, a bit lower level of these stress markers. So I'm showing here BIP is significantly lower, CHOP is significantly lower. Um, CPN10 and HSP60 are also significantly lower. while we don't see uh, a difference between ATF4 and ATF5 between the AP lines and controls. Now, in terms of stress responses, uh, we have looked only at transcriptional level of these markers and we didn't do any treatments um, to increase the stress level. So we don't know how the stress level would um, change if you challenge the cells with a uh, type of stress. And also, we didn't do a uh, galactose uh, media challenge, which appears to enhance um, the stress of, for the cells. Uh, moreover, some of these transcription factors are better uh, looked at with an immunofluorescence assay, where we see whether they are localized in the nucleus, where they are active, or if they are um, kind of spread everywhere. 
So perhaps for APF4 and CHOP would be useful to have a run of the plate to see the distribution nucleus versus cytoplasm and to see um, how much activity is, is there in that uh, respect. Um, so we have summarized what I have told you here. So in the family view, we see um, more consistency in the data for the AT line and the father. The mother shows more variability and some of the parameters are lower for the, um, the AT line. In the AT lines compared with the controls, um, HMASH controls, again, we see um, some of these markers being uh, decreased as compared to the control. And the last uh, type of assay that um, we are doing, and we have run several plates, but we are still in the process of analyzing the data, is to look at various cellular compartments with different sets of fluorophores. So starting from the literature, we have defined a number of uh, fluorophore panels to look at mitochondrial morphology, the cytoskeleton, um, ER Golgi compartments, and also the lysosomes. And I'm only showing you the lysosomal uh, staining, which uh, again seems to increase lysosomal um, staining in the galactose media. And we think that visually from how we have run the plates, there may be an enhanced lysosomal accumulation in the 8P lines. And here we have a bit of a better, um, an increased uh, a zoom of those images. So this is uh, where we are with this assay. So the conclusion is that some of the 8P lines seem to be more resistant to cell death. Um, they show decreased level of certain stress markers. And in the cell painting, we are still working on the analysis, but the 8P lines seem to have more uh, lysosomal staining. And our key next step is to finalize the analysis of the data and uh, see which of the parameters show the best differences to be taken forward for um, analysis of uh, drug effects. But for the moment, the DNA damage assay and perhaps this lysosomal staining appear to be um, quite promising. And we, um, we still have to look at the mitosox and TMRE in terms of mitochondrial homeostasis. Uh, and here there may be a um, number of interesting uh, facts that can uh, bring up more details about um, mechanisms involved and how this behave. Thank you. Thank you, Nicoletta. So let's now um, maybe have a, a, a smooth transition maybe to Professor Motri, if, if you don't mind giving us a brief recap, and then I'll come back in and start out the question and answer period. Um, so if you have any burning questions right now for uh, about the fibroblast data you just heard, please drop them in the chat so we can return to them. But I want to now kind of give you a different perspective uh, from sort of a very different cell type um, and uh, a sort of different different focus here <clears throat> in terms of more disease modeling than, than drug repurposing immediately. But Professor Motri, please take it away. All right. Uh, thank you, Ethan. Uh, thanks, everybody. Um, yeah, so this is a brief update on uh, where we are on, on this project. And just to keep uh, everybody on the loop, uh, let me step a little bit back and explain a little bit what is the model system that we decided to work on. So this is uh, what, what we call a brain organoid uh, these days, was uh, originally developed by Yoshiki Sasai in Japan in 2008. Um, so it's a it's kind of an old technology, uh, but has been gaining momentum over the past years. Um, and my lab always uh, worked with uh, these uh, tools. Um, and basically, this is a recreation of uh, the uh, human nervous systems in vitro um, using human pluripotent stem cells. Pluripotent stem cells are the ones that can differentiate or specialize in different tissues of the body, including the brain. So my lab's uh, expertise is on defining protocols 
better protocols to create better models of um, the human brain. And uh, the beauty of this model is that it recapitulates uh, early stages of neurodevelopment, uh, basically um, fetal uh, first, second trim trimester of gestation plus uh, postnatal stage. So that's, that's the time frame that we have here. And uh, so in this original publication, you can see already the formation of the cortical plate very nicely, um, meaning that the cells are able to self-organize uh, alone. So we investigators, we just need to kickstart the process and then the cells will do it by themselves, which is, um, which is really cool. It suggests that everything is uh, genetically pre-programmed to do. So we don't have to tell um, each cell where to go. I mean, they just, um, again, together, they do it by themselves. Um, so uh, the, uh, there are limitations with this technology, and I always like to uh, alert the parents because you see lots of uh, terms in the media, uh, especially uh, the mini brain approach, which gives you the impression that what we really have is a fully mature human brain in a dish, and that's definitely not the case. Um, there are many differences and many uh, limitations of this protocol. For example, the neurons are quite immature. As I mentioned, these are more fetal early postnatal uh, brain cells that we can get. They're not yet vascularized, and that's why they are tiny. That's why we call them mini. Um, the vascularization will help them to, uh, to grow bigger. But right now, um, it's, it's really orders of magnitude smaller than the human brain. Um, we don't have all the cell types represented um, because we are missing signals that we don't know how to recreate in a dish. Um, and even the ideal conditions to keep these organoids alive um, has not been fully optimized yet. And of course, there are um, ethical questions that um, uh, down the road, it might become more relevant, but, but not now. Um, all right, so um, once we have that, uh, this is the protocol that I'm using. And I, I was using the iPSL lines that were derived from the trio, mom, dad, and the proband carrying the 8P uh, alteration. Um, we have these uh, pretty potent stem cells. We dissociated the cells into single cells. So each dot here is one individual cell line. And then we neuralize them by adding factors that uh, induces them to differentiate in specific brain regions. Um, here we choose the cortex. The cortex is uh, in your frontal brain here uh, and is uh, the region responsible for cogn co cognition. It's heavily implicated in intellectual disability and autism. That's why we like to focus in the cortex first, but we, can, we have protocols to make other brain regions as well. So once we neuralize, they, the cells now know that they want to become um, cortical brain tissue. We stimulate their proliferation by adding growth factors such as FGF and EGF. They responded to that by inducing the proliferation. So we see a high speed increase of the size of these uh, tiny balls here. Um, and, and after like two weeks, we just remove these growth factors and we let them mature. So they do it by themselves. Again, I mean, we, we, we are just manipulating the factors that we have in the media. They are all floating in three dimension. And um, any family who wants to come and visit the lab and check it out how we do it, um, you guys are welcome. Uh, and so, it, I mean, just here, it's clear that you start from single cell and you end with these... Uh, bulk is sphere here that contains about 5 million neurons in there um, by the end of um, uh, three, four months. Uh, so this is the size of a bee brain and has the complexity um, that mimics uh, the early preterm uh, baby brain um, if you keep them maturing for, for a long time. Um, some people ask what kind of cells you have in there. So let me show you the anatomy first. Uh, you have a ventricular zone. This is a, a cross section of one of those balls with 5 million neurons. A cross section will show that you have ventricular zones. We call those rosettes. Um, the progenitor cells are surrounding these uh, rosettes. Um, and you see that there are newborn neurons that will migrate out to form this uh, nice stack of cells. This is the cortical plate. And they do it by following these cables here in white. These are the radioglia cells that um, instruct how the newborn neurons need to migrate out and where to, to adjust themselves into the network. Um, so the reason why uh, they are tiny, it's because after um, uh, several months, uh, the nutrients that comes by diffusion can no longer reach the center of the organoid uh, and could not stimulate the progenitor cells to produce more neurons. 
So we are working on a vascular system now that might make them um, increase um, the number of cells and increasing size as a consequence. But right now, most of the protocols lack this, uh, this kind of vascularization. So they are tiny balls. Uh, you can actually see at naked eye. Uh, and in terms of uh, diver uh, diversity of cell types, uh, it really depends. Um, so this is a very dynamic model. You start from the pluripotent stem cells and you end up with uh, 5 million neurons in there. What else uh, do we have? So this is a snapshot at four months. Uh, at four months, you have your pool of progenitor, cell, progenitor cells that are still alive. These progenitor cells have become mostly glutamatergic neurons. These are excitatory neurons that produces the excitation or or, or, or the, connect, the early connections in, in the brain. So they are um, quite important for the establishing of the first uh, networks um, in your brain. Um, and, uh, but at, the, at that stage, some of these progenitor cells are becoming also um, GABAergic neurons. Uh, this is a discrete pool of GABAergic neurons. They are showing the markers of GABA. So GABA is a, a, a inhibitory um, neurotransmitters that will tone down and start shaping how these networks behave, adding more complexity um, to the system. At that stage, we also have the, the generation of uh, glia cells, mostly astrocytes. So the astrocytes are the ones that uh, are going to help the neurons to form and establish strong synapses, um, and it's going to help to shape this network as well. So this is all happening at four months. In the beginning, we just have progenitor cells and, and, and glutamatergic neurons. And, and that's important because the data I'm going to show you, it's mostly between one and two months. So we are not talking about um, uh, glia cells. We are not talking about inhibitory neurons. We are talking about in progenitors and glutamatergic neurons at that stage. Uh, you might have the markers for other cells, but not yet fully uh, differentiated. All right, uh, here's um, my quick update. Um, as I mentioned, we have organoids at one month and we have organoids at two months. And um, there are several things that we are doing. I'll, I'll mostly focus on the uh, initial observations at one month. Uh, we now have collected organoid up to nine months of the trio. And we are doing like the complete analysis uh, to understand better what are the dynamics um, uh, during this time frame. But here we are looking mostly at um, uh, analysis of the morphology of the organoid, as well as uh, the type of cells that they are producing, spontaneously producing. This is how they look like, uh, three days organoids, 15 days organoids, 30 days organoids, and 60 days organoids. So you can definitely see that they start with small spheres, kind of uh, heterogeneous in nature, but they will become more and more homogeneous, and, um, and, and the size of these spheres are growing over time suggesting that there are more proliferation uh, happening at this stage. Um, so uh, some people might catch that there are slightly differences in size here, um, but the human eye, human eye is not really good at these small differences. So that's why we quantify. And here is uh, the diameter of each one of these organoids. So if dot in these graphics um, are coming from um, two batches of organoids and each one represents one organoid. Um, so uh, J1 and J2 are, uh, are the parental cell lines, uh, and J3 is the proband. Um, and uh, there are slightly different between J1 and J2, um, and also like a strong differences um, compared to J3 uh, at 30 days. Um, if you just let this go um, one more month, uh, the differences becomes clear, and uh, these differences will remain more or less constant. Uh, throughout uh, the entire uh, nine months that we kept the organoids. Um, we definitely observe uh, a more severe uh, phenotype or smaller uh, spheres um, in, in the proband compared to the other two. So small organoids um, can mean different things. It might mean that the cells are not proliferating, so the cell cycle might not be ideal, or the cells are dying, so we might see like more cells dying or the cells are having like an early differentiation. So they are differentiating in something else um, that um, uh, does not belong to the organoid. So there are many reasons why an organoid is smaller compared to the controls. Um, some people like to say that this might mimic um, a small microcephaly or the size of the brain. Um, we do see that correlation in some cases, not always. Uh, remember, this is just the cortex, it's not the entire brain. 
So we're just talking about the cortical formation here. So we're looking to proliferation. And the proliferation, I mean, doesn't seem, uh, at least for this method here, and I'll tell you about the, some of the limitations of, of, of these methods. Um, they are uh, pointing to uh, kind of a same number of cells that are proliferating between 80 and 90%. And this is according to um, previous work in my lab, this is normal. This is what we, we, we normally see um, in, in, in the organoids as well. Um, so uh, here we start looking at um, cell death. We're looking for markers of apoptosis uh, and uh, necro necro necrosis as well. So here is uh, in these uh, uh, lower uh, back here is uh, the health cells. And, and here you have your necrotic cells and here your early apoptotic cells. So uh, here we have J1 showing a little bit more apoptosis compared to controls, uh, compared to J2 and J3. Um, but again, I mean, in these early days, I mean, we have lots of variations. Um, it, it, it's more relevant uh, when you look at uh, later time points. So this is 60 days. Um, 60 days, then we start seeing a little bit more uh, robust cell death in, in J1, uh, in J1 and J3 uh, compared to J2. Um, again, uh, it's still, still not like a lot, cannot really explain the the differences um, in, in the organoids, uh, but it might give us a hint of uh, uh, that uh, there are uh, definitely some cells um, dying there. So we then switch to the uh, single cell RNA-seq, and for those who are not familiar with this idea, um, the, uh, the protocol here is very simple. It's, it's, it's almost like an explosion of the organoid. You just explode the organoid, and then you look at each, each cell individually, and we ask the question, what kind of genes those cells are, are expressing? Uh, and then we use the, that information to kind of a cluster uh, the cells in different groups um, according to the uh, gene expression profile. Um, so one of the limitations here is that we're looking for genes, um, not really proteins. Um, and uh, there is a huge variability between gene expression and protein expression. So just uh, keep in mind that this is... Um, uh, definitely like one of the limitations of the single cell. But nonetheless, uh, oh, another limitation is that um, the single cell doesn't give the depth um, of uh, uh, all the genes in the cells. You are getting like the most expressed genes. So you might be missing some information here. But again, um, I think my message here is that there is no method that is complete and, and, and ideal. Um, really what scientists are doing is performing different experiments to have trying to get a big picture that idea of uh, all the blind men looking for the elephant, everybody's holding a piece, trying to guess what, what it is. Um, and, and that's the idea here. So um, this is uh, the technical specs for the single cell that we um, uh, we perform. We use this uh, method here, amply drop. Uh, this is a three prime um, uh, uh, RNA-seq. Um, we have uh, three samples each. We got libraries that are about 10K. Um, and we did that with a new company that uh, didn't charge us because they're just optimizing their protocol here. Uh, but they were able to get uh, both frozen and fresh samples um, in, 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 in 2000 uh, scale libraries, which is really good. Um, so we, we're going to stick with them in the future because they seem to, um, to have like a very nice new technology here. All right. So this is uh, how the data look like. Um, and uh, each one of uh, the iPSCs or each one of the organoid has a different color here, J1, J2, and J3. This is the number of cells that we, uh, we sequence from each of these organoids. And, um, and, and we su superimpose all the colors here. And, 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 and hopefully you can, um, you can see that there are overlap among most of them, um, but there are certain populations that are quite unique. Um, especially to J J3. So you see more of the blue here, um, which is the pro band, uh, some very discrete populations here on top that only appears uh, in, in the pro band uh, and we don't see in the parental cell lines. So these are the expression of some of these markers. Um, and as we expected for one month organoid, um, what we have is more markers for proliferation. These are um, SOX2 positive cells, um, PDA1, uh, VGF, again, suggesting that mostly what we have there are uh, vimentin. These are progenitor cells um, that would become 
something else. Most likely neurons, because we already see like a population of uh, MAP2 here, which is an early marker um, uh, for neurons. Um, but again, we are looking for differences. What, what's unique? Um, among the proband in, 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 in uh, here on, on my top right here is just the distribution of these different uh, cell populations um, um, among the trio. So this is the conclusion that we have um, in uh, agreement with the idea that the organoids at one month are the ones that are mostly fully uh, 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 full of uh, cells that are replicating. So we have these uh, markers that are markers for early neuroprogenitor cells, um, low number of uh, neuron cells, for example, DCX, which is uh, newborn neurons, um, but there are early signs of glutamatergic identity, which is something that I mentioned to you. Most of these newborn neurons will become excitatory neurons. Um, we have abundance of uh, dividing cells, uh, but there are, I mean, the single cell already pick it up some differences uh, between the different clusters. Uh, and the father and mother has like two times or three times more dividing cells than, than the proband. Um, so something that uh, we couldn't observe pretty clearly on the facts, um, maybe because it was too um, early, but by gene expression, um, we already see like a more significant uh, alteration. And of course, I mean, the SOX2 are the dominant cells. All right. So uh, in the proband, uh, these are things that uh, uh, we see early on that requires validation, of course, but we are following up on a longitudinal analysis. A fewer fraction of the dividing cells, which might explain why the organoid turns out to be uh, 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 smaller than the controls. And uh, these fractions of, um, we call them oligodendrocytic population. Um, it's the cluster 15. If I go back, the cluster 15 is um, it's in here this partially uh, oligo-like uh, cell type. Oh. Um, and we are not 100% sure that they will become oligodendrocytes. This is not what we meant. It, it's just that they are expressing some of the same markers that uh, oligodendrocyte cells are uh, showing. Um, and we have like a slightly higher fraction of uh, radioglia cells, uh, which are the ones that I told you that help the migration of the cells. Um, they seem to be a little bit more differentiated than uh, what we like to see, suggesting that, well, maybe some of these progenitor cells are um, having like an early differentiation or becoming something else that are not supposed to be there. For example, an early population of oligodendrocyte precursor cells. So this is, um, uh, this is the picture that we have now. It's only when we have... Uh, uh, the longitudinal analysis with other time points that we will be able to follow up each one of these individual populations um, to see if they remain as it is or if they become um, something else, something more uh, uh, dramatic or something that we can recognize as uh, unusual or, or, or unique um, to the proband compared to the controls. All right, so that's, um, that's my update uh, and I'll stop sharing here. Fantastic. All right. So I know we've got about 13 minutes. There's so much that was presented. Um, obviously, uh, we, we could spend a lot of time on both both presentations, but maybe to get things going, I want to say first off that in the chat, um, if you are interested for the families, if you are interested in um, volunteering uh, skin samples uh, so that the fibro, the AP fibroblast collection can grow, uh, I dropped in into the chat that you should reach out um, either in this channel, or if you want to reach out privately, please reach out to Bina and we can try to, uh, see if we can increase the number of, uh, cells in, in the bank, the biobank. Um, but I also want to just maybe quickly remark that I'm, I'm trying to look at my notes here, but I think there were, there were, there was some phenotype where the paternal and the proband, I think, look more similar to, to each other than the maternal and the fibroblast and it looked like there was a, a readout where that was also true in the organoids. So even though obviously brain organoids and skin fibroblasts couldn't be more different, I'm already noticing that there's some something there that maybe maybe means nothing, but at least there's something interesting the way uh, the the different the, the family trio sort of plays out in these different very different model systems. But um, I have some more specific questions that I want to open up to the audience here. Uh, anyone can please just jump in, and kick it off. Either questions to Nicoletta or to Allison, uh, either about the fibroblasts or the organoids. Um, please get it going. Otherwise, I have a list of questions I can also use to 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 uh, to spur conversation. But I want to open up to anyone else who wants to jump in first. 
So I actually have the same uh, general question for both of you, which is that um, whenever you work with these cell lines, and this is something that we think about too, there's a, even with the same genotype, there can be a lot of variability from line to line. And so I'm wondering with the specific assays that you're doing, how much variability do you see between your controls? And you know how does that compare to the variability that you see be, from the 8P to the other ones? And ideally, how many uh, sort of clones of each, say, fibroblast line or 8P line what would you be doing or is feasible to do? Thanks. Uh, thank you for the question. Yeah, I think one of the issues is indeed the individual variability. And we have seen that um, there is variability between the AP line and the parents control. And there is also variability between the AP lines themselves and also between the controls, um, HMASH controls that we have used. And that's why um, eight P, four AP lines that we have got gave us uh, um, probably enough um, data points to get some of these assays showing a significant difference. So if we see some consistent um, difference between the 8P lines and the 8 March control, then that is an assay that can be um, taken further for screening, for example. So uh, just, just to follow up on that, I, I guess what I'm also wanting, these 8P lines and, and we're, you know, working with some of these in IPS cells, they can have very different genotypes, right? And you might, I, I don't know why we would necessarily expect to see, say, consistent genotypes between deletions and duplications, for example, or things like that. So I, you know, I, uh, on the one hand, I would hesitate to throw away phenotypes that are different between different that are say are not consistent across AP lines because maybe they will cons turn out to be consistent for a subset of genotype, you know, a subset of genotypes. And on the other hand, I, I, I think, you know, I would worry about just for a given genotype, like how many times are we measuring different clones of the same genotype to to see what the variability is there. Well, for the fibroblasts, some of the experiments, we have repeated them between three to five times to get enough data to make sure that our um, comparisons are significant or not. And I think you're right that because of the individual variability, where do we draw the line of what you select in terms of an endpoint? But I think that if we want to look at screening, perhaps we want to have an endpoint that characterizes more than one line because right, we which... have the possibility. You can always just look at one single line, but then you need to think about what your controls are. So if you take the controls as parents, then there is the variability of the parents. If you take the controls as HMARS controls, you have seen that there is variability between those as well. So I think it depends a little bit on how you want to approach. And I think for a screening purpose, having an endpoint that characterizes more than one line is perhaps a good point to start, but that's my view. I agree. I think, Ari, was part of your question also just like the intrinsic variability between like even technical replicates of the same sample? It seemed like in some of the experiments, there was a just a larger variance of a sample. And was that, is that a function of the aneuploidy or of the cell line? Because we didn't seem to see that in the controls necessarily. So was that partly what you're getting already as well or? Yeah, but uh, I mean, beyond technical replicates, I from what I understand and also what's been available to my lab, there's only one cell line for each genotype, right? So you may, even if you do technical replicates and you find, okay, you know, these are bang on the same, we can do this assay really well. It could be if you were to go back to that same patient and derive another line, it wouldn't be the same. It would just be a different population of cells or something happen. And we see, you know, in our own hands, if we make subclones of the same ES cell line, they'll behave differently because there's different things in that population. So I, I think if we're trying to associate genotype to phenotype, measuring more than one population of each genotype may it, it, it in some cases it's not feasible I and mean, we just can't get the samples or whatever but i i think it may be important totally and the new protocol for the stem cell lines that we're creating now should be ready soon we'll have multiple clones of each um not necessarily for the knockouts right that you have um but you know, that's kind of in the direction that we're going. And Allison, I know you said like, ideally we would do it that way, but um, mm. you know, again, it kind of depends on like 
what we're trying to get yeah. at. In, the, uh, the knockouts in, uh, we make will have we we make multiple clones for both homozygous and heterozygous of everything. Allison, do you have any thoughts on the clonality? I, no, I, uh, no, this is right. I mean, I I, I see this is a, a preliminary data, right? I mean, we're just getting started. Um, I I don't see as any any conclusion here, uh, and I I wouldn't take any conclusion just in in one trio. It might guide you where to go, um, but we definitely need more. More, more, more families uh, to be part of the research if you want to find something, um, and and I think that's that's when we're going to find the differences among them. But that requires la large sample size. I mean, I, I think here we are we are just getting our hands wet to to do something to to see if there are any. I'm I'm personally looking for something um, very unusual that, that might happen in in this uh, 8P line uh, that I don't see in other clones in in my lab or I don't see any other. Um, uh, diseases that my lab has worked. Um, but he's right. I mean, usually what we do is uh, at least like two or three clones for each cell line, uh, multiple batches. Uh, but to me, more importantly, um, multi multiple probe bands, multiple families um, uh, to have something conclusive. Great. Let's move to Faye and then Stefan. Thanks. I think my question's uh, mostly for Alison about the, you know, so the, the proban showed less dividing cells, right? So I'm just wondering um, about the nutrient levels, like almost sort of like going back to Nicoletta's talk as well. Did you measure the nutrient levels in the medium to see if it was depleted more? Like, you know, than, um, yeah, yeah. Than, the, than the parents? No. Yeah, we, we have not done that, no. No. Yeah, I think that might be interesting. And I'm just thinking as well for Nicoletta. So there, there you had the comment on the slide about the lysosomes. What was what was that? There were more lysosomes? It that? looks by eye, we have to quantify that there are more lysosomes stained in the 8P lines. And the galactose seems to um, show that a bit better. And so now, sorry? Uh, sorry, yeah, I sorry, it's correct me if I'm wrong. What does the lysosome do? Is that where the proteins get broken? Okay, down? so lysosomes are clearing um, debris in the cells. They can be organelles that are damaged, protein that, proteins that are damaged. So, so that, that makes total sense, right, with the, with the duplication, because presumably where you've got that triple number, you'd be seeing excessive amounts of protein, right? So and and that will be requiring more energy as well. So could that possibly be what you know what's going on there? There could be. So if quantification will confirm that, then we would have to see why there are more lysosomes. There is mm -hmm. uh, more um, autophagy turnover, or there is a blockage of autophagy, and there are a few um, mechanistic steps to be investigated there. Great. And the, the levels of sort of uh, sugars, essentially, like all the sugars that you have in there, are they physiological? Are they like way more than physiological? I'm just sort of wondering how it compares. When we talk about high glucose, that's higher than physiological. And that's why the um, metabolic um, format of these cell cultures is towards glycolysis. And in order to shift that to a more physiological pattern, we use the galactose, which shows the stronger results because that uh, is inducing the mitochondria to do more ATP through oxidative phosphorylation, which is a more physiological um, way of producing energy. And that's highly relevant for the, for the brain where oxidative phosphorylation is the key metabolic pathway of the mitochondria. Perfect. Thank you. Thank you both. Really nice talks. Thank you. Yeah, I, I wanted to comment as well whether we can make statements about are these cells obviously much more are they are they glycolytic even in spite of growing on galactose? I guess we can explore those kinds of questions. Uh, I don't know uh, if, if Rui, you have any thoughts here from maybe your work in trisomy twenty one. But Stefan, uh, let's go to you next. Then Joseph, and I know I know we're going to go up against time here, but if you can hang out a little extra, that'd be great. And then we will obviously share the video after the fact. But Stefan, go for it. Yeah. Uh, Thank you. Uh, who, who first? Me? Yes, go for it. You're first. Yep. Yeah, no, no. I just found this in you know, the last of two is very interesting because um uh, first of all oh, sorry, 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 Joseph. That was for Stefan. He's he got he got the hand up first. Sorry. Sorry. Stefan first, then Joseph. 
It's fine. It's fine. Oh, I'm sorry. Yeah. I've... No worries. No, I just went by hand order. I have a very short question. I just had yeah. a very short question for for Allison. Um, so, uh, is that are you using Fluent Biosciences? Is that is that the company you're working with? Fluent Biosciences. Yeah. Yeah. I think so. Yeah. yeah. Okay, um, and then um, and then the other question I had was at the uh, what what depth like how many reads per cell are you se sequencing to roughly? Do you know? I think it was ten uh, k. Ten k. Okay, so at that depth, can you see? Um, I'm just curious whether you can see the um, the the impacted genes in the eight p interval. Can you actually detect them at sufficient numbers that you can, let's say, within one cell type, ask? Okay, this gene is really reduced by half, or this gene is, is increased by fifty percent. Can you see that no. at the single cell level? Oh, that that's the analysis that we're doing now. We are we are, we are looking okay. for those genes on, on on the region to see if there are anything that pops out. Yeah. Okay, great. Just just to even know what genes are even expressed in your cell type out of out of right. those. Yeah. Thank you. All right, Joseph, you're next, and then for anyone else who wanted to raise their hand, uh, please enter the queue. Joseph, go for it. Oh, uh, yeah, no, I, I mean, I just also really you know, impressed by, you know, this life freedom study because uh, 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 there, there's an idea that uh, when, when there's an unemployed, uh, so the, the gene gene balance, like, you know, the two geometric balance has, you know, kind of altered. So so to uh, the, to compensate that uh, uh, imbalance on, on the, the protein protein amount, there's some, you know, more lysosomal or like in you know, the flux in going on. So, so there's such an idea, like you know, when, uh, like you know, because so let's say you know, protein A and protein B, you know, has to be always you know one to two ratio in stoichiometry. stoichiometry. And then uh, if if there's a nucleoid, then this this uh, the the ratio could be altered. So there might be more waste because of, uh, there's some you know uh, uh, protein components that does make you know. Uh, uh, um, the, the one to a matching. So to deal with that, the waste, uh, 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 there's some kind of, you know, a plus, you know, going on, you know, which is quite, quite common for cancer, but I'm not sure about this case. But but I think there's the one direction that, that you can actually, you know, seek. Yeah, thank you for the thank suggestion. You. I think that's something we need to measure and and see where we are with it. Any other thoughts from anybody? Again, especially from our AP researchers, if, if uh, again, we know this is preliminary, we know it's fibroblasts, it's brain organoids, different systems, different different purposes, but any other thoughts? We'll also try to figure out a way to follow up by email and maybe um, once the data set is complete on Nicoletta side, we definitely want to uh, follow up as well. But any other thoughts at the moment? Ethan, uh, this is Jean-Pierre, sorry, I'm yes. not on video. Uh, no I had I put a question in the chat and I was asking whether in either uh, working on the fibroblast or working on the organoids, has there been a differentiating test between only the cell lines that are individual uh, inversion duplication deletion versus the other eight P lines? Because yeah, I, think, I think yeah. Go ahead. Yeah. Um, thank you for the question. I think yeah, that's a very important point. We have seen that there are differences between the 8P lines, but we have not correlated yet the okay. uh, distinct type of um, inversion duplication or deletion, the mutations with what we have seen in terms of the phenotypes in our assays, but this is going to be part of our analysis towards the end when we have got all the data uh, cleared through, let's say. All right, because there may be another second correlation that you might want to consider, which is in the case of inversion duplication deletion, it might be much more correlated with the mother line than the father line, just because of how it's created genetically. Yeah, I think we have probably seen some of that, but we kind of, we didn't focus on this um, correlation at the moment. We are kind okay. of globally looking at everything and then We'll go back once we have all the data and all the assays repeated a few times with Thank you. controls. Thank you. Great, great question. Thank you for, for, for speaking up there. And last last point to Huri. Uh, wonderful talk, um, Nicoletta and Allison. Um, I, I just had a question for Nicoletta. So when the hypothesis is that there's some sort of mitochondrial dysfunction and so associated with that, there'll be increased DNA damage accumulation. 
And so with gamma H2X, you're looking at double-stranded DNA breaks. So I guess the idea is that fundamentally, you know, AP syndrome has dysfunction in, in DNA damage repair. But if it is associated with mitochondrial dysfunction, would you, you anticipate that these lesions would be single-stranded, oxidative, you know, like looking at 8-oxo or some other like phospho-ATR would be more informative? Like, or are you thinking that these damages would be so persistent that they're converting to double-stranded DNA breaks? So it's kind of um, the type of assay that you can probably do in a screening and they would be the persistent type of damage that we are looking at. Um, in terms of mitochondria nucleus interaction in the, when there is a stress challenge, um, the key hypothesis was that mitochondria and the nucleus would compete for uh, metabolites in order to uh, repair and uh, repair themselves and um, keep functioning at normal levels. So that's why we are using these challenges to see what happens when we challenge mitochondria, what happens when we challenge um, the DNA damage repair mechanisms. So that's how we are trying to correlate. Um, we didn't yeah. really look at um, single strand break, break breaks yet, but we are going to look at oxidative stress from a global cellular point of view and from the um, mitochondrial point of view with mitosox and see how that plays into um, the different types of challenges. Yeah, which is super interesting because for us in Down syndrome, we see a very cell type specific oxidative stress. So we've done comments on induced glucose stem cells and neuroprogenitor cells, and we don't really see increased double-stranded DNA breaks, but what we do see is increased oxidative DNA lesions and single-stranded DNA breaks. And we confirmed that with phospho-ATR, and we see that the, this sort of, you know, mitochondrial dysfunction, you know, DNA damage associated with starts at a, at a very specific cell type. Um, so we're mapping the DNA breaks now just to try to understand how they impact gene expression in Down syndrome. But I think it's super interesting that AP is also similar. But I think we should talk. I think um, yeah, we need to take uh, this separately. Yeah. Well, yeah. It's I, more I propose about we'll have a... the assays, how you can do it for a screen type of analysis. Yeah, I propose that we have a separate uh, sort of conversation, um, maybe off of the the roundtable series, where maybe we have a smaller group uh, that's focused on these cell 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 assays and translating to to uh, to repurposing or other screens. Because I think we definitely you, you definitely have a, a lot of knowledge there, Rui, that we we can we could spend a lot of time diving into. But yeah, let, let's follow up uh, separately. But thank you everybody for joining. I know we're over time. This will be shared over the YouTube thank channel. You. And Bina, any last words to you? All right, that's a thumbs up, meaning we're, it's a wrap, folks. Thanks, everybody, for joining again. We'll see you at the next round. Thank you, everyone. And we Thanks, everybody. Uh, yeah, we very much appreciate it.